Thank you and good afternoon. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and I really was very excited to get this invitation. I think this is really a great audience to be able to share some of our research so that I can explain to you what we've done in our findings on frailty, but also to learn from you and to hear from you on how we can help move this research into clinical practice. So I think before I get started, I just want you to think about the word frailty. Um, I've started to almost keep a list of all the times that I see it coming up in the lay press. There's um, even a movie entitled Frailty. I've not seen it, but I don't think it has anything to do with what we'll be talking about today. So again, I'm Dr. McAdams DeMarco from Johns Hopkins, um, and I'm sharing the work that's uh, been a number of years of collaboration between many different centers and groups within, uh, within our school, and I'll talk about that as we walk through. Uh, the work was funded by the uh, U.S. National Institutes of Health and by the American Society of Nephrology. Uh, and you'll see that we have quite a breadth of research at this point, and um, it's thanks to the wonderful support and funding that we've had. So I'll start with just asking you to think about your clinical population. If I have two patients who are going to be undergoing transplantation, one is a 42-year-old, and it's a woman who's developed ESRD after years of hypertension, and another woman who's 68 who very similarly developed ESRD after hypertension. Who do you think would do better? I'll give you a second to just think about this. Who's more likely to have better outcomes? Say the younger patient. What happens if I added one more piece of information, that the younger recipient was in fact frail at the time of transplantation, but the older recipient was non-frail? For how many of you did this change your, your thought process? And so a good number. So let's actually walk through and see what happens to these two patients. What is their risk of developing poor outcomes after transplantation? And we'll focus on four different outcomes. Delayed graft function, late, uh, longer length of hospital stay after transplantation, early hospital readmission, and mortality. Well, what we see for delayed graft function is that there actually isn't much of a difference. It's about 16% risk for both groups. We see for the longer length of hospital stay, in fact, the younger frail recipient was more than twice as likely to have a longer length of stay and was more than twice as likely to have an early hospital readmission after transplantation. And importantly, we see a similar result with mortality. The younger frail recipient was in fact nine, had 9% 9 likelihood of mortality, whereas the older non-frail counterpart had 4% risk of mortality. So how can we start to demystify this concept of frailty? It's really a term that's commonly used, a um, lot of ambiguity both in the literature uh, and also in the common language use of the term. So when we talk about frailty, we talk about a concept of physiologic reserve. How well do you bounce back from a stress? If there's a stress of surgery, of dialysis, how able are you to overcome that and to to bounce back and rebound from stressors. You can think about this easily in your population. Uh, when, you, when you watch a patient get up from the bed, are you doing a foot of the bed assessment to see how vibrant, how robust they are? These are all terms that we think of as encompassing this idea of physiologic reserve. And we didn't come up with this ourselves. This is actually borrowed from our geriatrics and gerontology colleagues. We always think that we really learn from the best here. They've been able to identify frailty in community-dwelling older adults. They saw this as a way of um, quantifying how well a patient was going to deal with a stressor. But when we think about ESRD, we know that elderly is, in fact, a very different construct than for community-dwelling older adults. We can all imagine the <coughs> older ESRD patient that, in fact, is really only 42 or 43 years old. So how did we begin? Well, in 2001, Dr. Linda Freed, who is now at the uh, Mailman School of Public Health in Columbia, developed this validated construct. It was a phenotype that was meant to directly measure and give a uniform definition to this kind of commonly used term, frailty. Uh, it was validated and studied in the community, uh, the cardiovascular health study, which I'll talk about a bit in more detail. It was a study of community-dwelling older adults who were 65 and older. Then we, eight years ago, decided that this was actually probably a really important way for us to better improve risk prediction in the ESRD population um, that we have at Johns Hopkins. So to do this and to test out these hypotheses, 
we developed three co cohorts of adults with ESRD. The first was patients undergoing hemodialysis. The second was patients that were uh, getting onto the transplant wait list at Johns Hopkins. And the third was transplant recipients. And of note for our transplant recipients, um, this construct, which I'll walk through through the next slides and explain the detailed uh, measurement of frailty, we actually measure that on all of our patients at the time of transplantation. So when they're admitted to the hospital, we have a team there that actually measures this important construct on them. And as we've gone through the past eight years, we've really been able to look at longer and longer uh, outcomes. We started with delayed graft function, um, and we've really built to studying other hard uh, clinical outcomes and patient-centered outcomes, too. So let's just get back to how common frailty is in our population of adults with ESRD. And I'll note here, too, that when we talk about the cardiovascular health study, or the CHS, that's community-dwelling older adults, so they're 65 and older. Our patient population is all adults 18 and older with ESRD. And what we see um, in red here is that there are 46% of our ongoing dialysis populations that are frail, 26.8% of our waitlist population we've measured as being frail, and 21% of the transplant population uh, we've identified as being frail. This is a very stark contrast to community-dwelling older adults, where about 7% are um, identified as frail, and that's in the cardiovascular health study. Uh, my colleagues in geriatrics have actually done some newer studies that were recently published that show that actually the prevalence is a little bit higher in older adults that aren't necessarily community dwelling, which we would expect, um, but still not anywhere near the uh, rates of frailty that we see in our ESRD population. And again, our population is not limited by age. But what do you think happens when we consider the prevalence of frailty by different ages? Does anyone want to give me a thought? Do you think that you think there's an increase in frailty with age? Well, we did explore this a little bit. So we see in um, patients undergoing dialysis who are 18 to 45, there's about a 28% uh, prevalence of frailty, um, which is in the red bars. The pink bars represent intermediate frailty which is kind of a transitory state there, which I'll talk about in a little bit more. And we can see that with each increasing age bracket, we have a higher prevalence of frailty. And this exists in the dialysis population, in our waitlist population, and additionally in our transplant population too. Though you can see that the uh, rates of frailty in the transplant population at 65 and older actually isn't terribly different than the younger counterparts. And that's really due to the selection process and what it takes to be an older uh, adult who receives a transplantation. But regardless, whatever age strata we look, in the ESRD population, there's a higher prevalence of frailty than that of what we see in community-dwelling older adults that are 65 and older. So there, this, this is really an important construct that we really felt needed to be better understood. And really, we wanted to think whether or not we could use this as not just a marker of physiologic reserve, but also identify it as a, an important risk factor for poor outcomes in this population. Now we've spent a good bit of time just trying to get an introduction to the topic of frailty, um, but I will delve a little bit further into the definition of frailty um, as our first kind of point of discussion here. So how is it that they came up with a phenotype to define frailty? Again, it's a measure of a physiologic reserve and your resistance to stressors. How well do you bounce back from a stressor? Dr. Freed um, defined this as a multi-component syndrome, which interestingly included both physical and uh, self-reported components. So you're getting a patient perspective as well as directly observing and measuring um, these components. They include, ex uh, sorry, they include five components, decreased walk speed, exhaustion, decreased grip strength, low physical activity, unexplained weight loss, uh, and decreased walking speed. And these five components all build to uh, create the phenotype of frailty. As I mentioned, it was identified and validated in the cardiovascular health study, along with other uh, cohorts of older adults. And they found that not only were 7% of the population frail at the time of enrollment, but that within three years, 7% developed an incident frailty, 
So it was a dynamic state that was continuing uh, over time in which more and more uh, patients became, uh, participants became frail as they followed them. There was very little reversal of uh, their frailty state. And importantly, they noted that those who were frail were at more than twofold uh, more likely to die than their non-frail counterparts. So let's walk through the actual components and how they're measured. Shrinking is measured as the unintentional weight loss of 10 pounds or more in the past year. For our population, this becomes a challenge. And can you think of what the challenge would be with looking at unintentional weight loss in an ESRD population? Yes? Yes, exactly. So what we've done here is we've customized this a little bit. And in this component, we focus on dry weight for as best as we can capture that because there is such a fluctuation in weight um, for patients undergoing dialysis. Weakness is determined by grip strength. Uh, and exhaustion is a self-reported item um, that's uh, driven from the Centers for Epidemiologic uh, Studies Depression Scale, or the CESD scale. We also look at physical activity, which is, again, self-reported. And it's really meant to capture how a patient um, moves throughout their day. What are the activities that they've participated in recently? And we also, uh, as a contrasting point, we measure the uh, 15 feet normal paced walk to get a measurement of walk speed in this population. And, and one of the most common questions I get about this is, OK, these are five components. I understand that they comprise the phenotype. But well, how do you do this? How does this happen? Can you actually measure this in a clinical population? How long does it take? And the answer to that is to those questions is that we are able to do this in a clinical population. We measure frailty uh, at the time of evaluation. So uh, as the patients are spending the day with us at Hopkins, uh, we have a research staff and we have clinical staff who actually goes in and measures all five of these components. It takes less than 10 minutes to be performed, and we really have had very little problems with participants or patients wanting to, um, to uh, have this measured on them. We also do it, as I mentioned, at the time of transplantation. So as a patient is getting admitted to the hospital, regardless of the time of day, we have staff members there to uh, cover 24-7 patients. Um, they measure frailty as a patient is getting admitted. And so we have a measure of their physiologic reserve prior to any interventions and prior to transplantation. We also do this at the hemodialysis uh, center, too, where we are able to measure frailty on this population. Um, we've done this both at the dialysis center and on off-dialysis days, too. Does anybody have any questions about the measurement? This often is an area. Yes. Yes, um, it's the weakness is, I think, the um, Jamar um, dynamometer. I have it at the end. I can tell you the exact one. Um, and I'm sorry, the second one was? That was it. Yes, yeah, so we do have a, there is a standard calibrated tool that we use. It is a, the most common dynamometer that's out there and typically used for research purposes. Yes. To, to be defined as frailty? That'll be the next two slides. So I'll answer questions about the measurement, and then I'll happily jump to that. Yes? So, um, so how do you account for the fact that some of these patients have um, walking aids or not? Um, so, yep. So what we typically do is um, we do collect information on the participants um, that are involved in research and the patients that we're measuring this on to mark whether or not they have to use a walking aid. We ask if they could do the, um, the walk speed assessment without the aid. Um, and if they can't, then we have them use it and record the time there and, and just note that. What we've seen, anyone who uses an aid is typically classified as being frail with that component, regardless or not of whether or not they used the walking aid. That's a great question. Yes? Yeah, let me, you know, I'm going to actually just scroll to the end of this, if you don't mind, because there's questions about a little bit more detailed. OK. So the questions are, um, in the, how often in the past week have you felt this way? I felt that everything I did was an effort, and I could not get going, or the two exhaustion components. Uh, if a participant is 
reports feeling this way for three or more days in the past week, then they're considered frail. And the, uh, sorry, let me go down one. The grip strength, oh, I don't have the, it's, it's the Jamar dynamometer. Is it on there? Yep, and these are the actual specific cut points that are used. Another thing to note here that's very important is that we didn't redefine these cut points for our population. And we spent a lot of time discussing this um, with the biostatisticians and epidemiologists who work in aging uh, with us. And we really feel that it was important for us to use the same criteria as was defined in older adults and use those same cut points and thresholds um, for our ESRD population. That allows us to compare across these populations. So that actually, that will be captured more in the Minnesota Leisure Time activities um, and, and get their uh, physical activity component. So in some sense, it's almost scaled by that. But that is a, a really, um, that's a, a really interesting point. Yep, we, we just actually submitted a grant right before I left um, to study this kind of difference between fatigue, which is you know, how you self-report feeling fatigued versus your ability to be fatigued based on what you do. Absolutely, um, yeah, and that's, that, they didn't design to capture this. Um, one of the things we would eventually like to do is to better understand each one of these components as they relate to ESRD. So how do we take what was previously done in older adults and kind of update it for our populations? Um, that's something that we're thinking of as kind of a five-year long-term plan. And you said you'd want to put on dialysis base and come on dialysis base? And yes. Um, so we've looked at that in an incident hemodialysis population, and what we see is they're really, um, because these are measures are not meant to represent that day, we don't see much variation. It ends up being fairly reliable regardless of the day that it was measured on. The same thing too with the exhaustion and fatigue exhaustion. question, because sometimes people are very, they say they're exhausted yeah. on the, their dialysis base. And can you actually correctly <laughs> yeah, report how you felt in the last two weeks if you are very exhausted? And you know, from personal experience, we've probably all been there. He's, oh, yeah, I am really, really tired. But he's more of a transient state than, um, than a long-term state. Yes? So with the grip strength, um, mm -hmm. do you have a reference for that? And that's just this is for, I guess, certain age or is it for all age groups? Um, this is for all age groups. Um, it's just stratified by sex and by BMI. Um, it is in the, um, the, Freed, the original Freed publication. That's where kind of we've taken this all from. Great, I'm gonna head back to the slide that I was on before. Sorry for bouncing around. And just a reminder for everybody, if you remember these slides were all available on the national website, so we can have these discussions. Yes, um, and we're happy, I'm happy to talk to you um, by email about any of this work afterwards. So we, so in the community dwelling older adults, frailty is defined as having three or more of these components, intermediately frail, as having one or two of the components, and non-frail as having none of the components. But I'll challenge you to think, what are the potential limitations of trying to study frailty in this population of adults with ESRD? Anybody have any ideas? What could be one of our challenges? Well, one of the things that we've encountered is, in fact, oh, sorry, um, that there are very few of our participants even in the transplant population, which is going to be the healthiest of all the cohorts that have none, that have, have no com, uh, components of frailty. We find that most of our population, that 90% or so, has at least one of these um, as defined by the original publication. So there's just kind of statistical challenges to having a very small group of people who we would consider unexposed or non frail. So by this point, you're probably thinking, well, how does frailty differ than from comorbidity? And there are other proposed definitions of frailty that just list a whole bunch of comorbidities. Um, we think that for an ESRD population, that actually isn't appropriate given the high burden of chronic conditions. Um, but it was very important for us to be able to show that the phenotype of frailty is a distinct construct unto itself. This is from the original publication in older adults. 
in which they looked to see whether you could identify participants who were frail but didn't have a high burden of comorbidities and didn't have functional disabilities measured by activities of daily living. And what they found was, in fact, there is a population that is frail without comorbidity, without disability. This means that frailty is not synonymous with your comorbidity list. The way we think about it is, in fact, this is, frailty represents your ability to overcome the comorbidities. If you have a high burden of hypertension and diabetes, how well are you able to, to overcome that and compensate for that? Um, and that would be different than the actual kind of traditional summary scored list of comorbidities. And we really were intrigued by this concept of frailty as it was being developed in older adults because there seemed like there was a lot of overlap between the biological basis for frailty um, and ESRD. And the original publication included um, a very nice conceptual model of frailty. Um, I think I'd probably add more to it now after having done this work. Um, but we can clearly see that disease, um, for us ESRD and many comorbid conditions, would lead to the loss of muscle mass, um, which leads to decreased walking speed and strength, along with increased, decreased resting metabolism, uh, a decrease in total expenditure, chronic, um, un, sorry, and chronic undernutrition, which then feeds back into this loop state. Uh, and this really is a very nice conceptual model of frailty that we think parallels very much what's going on with patients with ESRD. The first work that was done was looking in a general surgery population. Uh, some of my colleagues and my mentor, Dr. Segev, uh, worked on some preliminary studies to understand surgical outcomes in frail and non-frail older adults. And they found that in a general surgery population, those who were frail uh, were at an increased risk of a post-operative complication, an increased length of stay, discharge to a skilled nursing facility, and of course, mortality too. So this represented, at least in a general surgery population, a very high risk group. Others have extended this work to show that frail uh, patients have a twice the odds of a 30-day complication. It was really from this basis we started to think about adapting and using frailty in our populations with ESRD. So the first work that we did um, was just to understand the prevalence. And I showed you a little bit more of this. Um, we saw that <clears throat> over 40% of patients that were currently undergoing dialysis or prevalent dialysis patients were frail, whereas about 30% that were newly starting dialysis were frail. And about 20% of transplant recipients were identified as being frail. This really suggested to us that it was an emerging, important risk factor that was clearly uh, not understood in this population. How were we able to take this concept that we borrowed from geriatrics and gerontology and apply it to patients with ESRD of all ages? Well, the first thing we did was we double-checked to make sure that what we were capturing in frailty wasn't just a um, different way to measure comorbidity. So similar to the previous uh, work that was done in community older uh, community dwelling older adults, we wanted to show that frailty was not synonymous with comorbidity and disability. So in the dialysis population, we showed that in fact there's about 20, which is the bottom Venn diagram there, there are 20% uh, percent of the population was frail without having any comorbidity or disability beyond ESRD. And this to us demonstrated that there was a group that you could identify who had this underlying uh, lack of physiologic reserve that wasn't simply um, a way of capturing their comorbidity or their disability. Uh, importantly, too, there was about 40% of the population that um, had not, no frailty, no disability, or no comorbidity. We first looked at frailty and uh, mortality in patients undergoing dialysis. We found that, in fact, there was an increased risk of mortality such that patients who were frail uh, while on dialysis were 2.6 times more likely to die than those who were non-frail. But very importantly, there wasn't much difference between frailty and intermediately frail. So if you had any of the components, it seemed to put you at risk versus none of the components. We extended this work to include other outcomes, too, in our hemodialysis population. We found that frailty was independently associated with mortality, as I just showed you, as well as an increased number of hospitalizations, <coughs> 
Uh, another group found that it was associated with the risk of a first hospitalization in this dia dialysis population. And very important for these patients, we found that uh, dialysis patients who were frail had threefold higher number of falls than those who were non-frail. And I think this is really the group um, that gets it. Frailty and falls are incredible complications for patients. It's a devastating um, turn of events that really leads to more and more complications and a quite uh, a profound decline for these patients. So we felt that this was actually very important work and something that we as a group are, are trying to study more, this relationship between frailty and falls, because it's often an overlooked outcome, yet very important for patients uh, and, of course, for their care providers, too. We've also done studies of frailty in kidney transplant recipients. And first, I just wanted to show you what the distribution of the score for frailty is in this population. As I mentioned, there are very few participants who have no, um, none of the five components of frailty. But we do see that a number have at least one, and we consider those two groups to be our non-frail. About a third of the population is intermediately frail, and 20% is frail. But, sorry, let me go back one. Um, but as you can see, after we get to three components, there aren't many, many patients that are all the way at the extremes of having all five components, which is a kind of an interesting thing um, when we start to think about interventions and ways of improving these patients. There are not many patients that have all five components, so maybe just a little bit of push is all we need to kind of get them back over that threshold to move them from being frail to a pre-frail state. One of the first papers that we did in transplant, uh, the transplantation epidemiology side was to look at frailty in early hospital readmission. So here I have the rates of early hospital readmission stratified by both age and by frailty status. What was very striking to us was in fact that the rates of early hospital readmission are higher in younger transplant recipients who are frail than in older transplant recipients who are non-frail. And in fact, if we compare the two dark blue columns, in fact, the rates of early hospital readmission really don't differ by age, but differ by frailty status. And in fact, we showed that there, uh, the patients who were frail had a, uh, sorry, I think, sorry, had a, um, am I too far? Nope, I'm sorry, it's anonymous. Um, had about a twofold increased risk of early hospital readmission. Uh, and it suggests that in fact, frailty was more of a driver of early hospital readmission than age was. We also showed uh, in this paper that even based on all the important registry predictors of early hospital readmission, all the things that are captured in the clinical data, in fact, this novel measure of ph physiologic reserve increased our ability to predict early hospital readmission in this population. Some other outcomes that we've looked at uh, with regard to frailty in the ESRD population include delayed graft function. We found that the frail kidney transplant recipients were at a 1.9-fold increased risk of delayed graft function. It was the strongest predictor of delayed graft function of all the possible factors that were included uh, in the model. So we felt that it was important to show that frailty drove a lot of short-term outcomes for these patients. And in fact, frailty may be the more important factor driving um, delayed graft function than some of the other commonly measured uh, risk predictors like age or sex or donor type. We also found that, um, similar to the dialysis population, that frail transplant recipients had a, more than a two-fold increased risk of mortality compared to their non-frail counterparts. And we also are working on a project now to show that, in fact, frailty increases your risk of spending two weeks or more uh, at the hospital for the time of transplantation. One of the more interesting studies that we've done, which really gets at this underlying idea of, of physiologic reserve, how well do you handle stressors, it was when we looked at immunosuppression intolerance in this population. And we found that the frail transplant recipients were about 1.3 times more likely to require a dose reduction in their MMF than their non-frail counterparts. They just can't tolerate the same doses. They end up experiencing more side effects, a lot of the GI complications, uh, than their non-frail counterparts. And this is, um, you know, this is commonly seen in older adults, that there's a lot more medication intolerance 
uh, for frail participants. Um, there's a very interesting study uh, that some of my colleagues have done showing that the immune response to the flu vaccine is less in older adults that are frail compared to non-frail. And this gets at that same underlying idea and construct. We also showed here um, that in addition to uh, these frail recipients requiring a dose reduction, this then led to a kind of a cascade of events in which the frail recipients um, ended up having more, the frail recipients who required a dose reduction uh, then having more graft loss, as would be expected. So we've studied a lot of uh, very clinically important outcomes. So with this work, we've studied early hospital readmission, delayed graft function, mortality, hospitalization in the dialysis population. Um, but there's also another um, set of outcomes that we're just starting to better understand now, which are the patient-centered outcomes. Does frailty impact a patient's lives not just through their risk of adverse events. What we found was that frail transplant recipients were about three times more likely to report fair or poor health-related quality of life than their younger counterparts, so, or their non-frail counterparts. So it's not just that they're at risk of poor outcome, but there's something underlying in frailty that actually is directly impacting the day-to-day -day life and the quality of these patients' lives. Additionally, we, we wanted to better understand what happens to these patients. So we see that frailty is associated with many poor outcomes, but is there anything positive? Is there anything we can do? This is some of our very uh, early work on understanding how frailty changes over time. And in fact, when we look at the geriatrics and gerontology literature, there's really only one or two papers that kind of looks at changes in frailty over time. They're not very in-depth. They don't really give us a good sense. But from the best we can see, frailty is kind of an absorbent state. Once you move along this pathway from non-frail to intermediately frail to frail, you don't really come back from what we've seen in the natural history of frailty for older adults. A lot of work still needs to be done there. But we wanted to understand this in our population, at least. So what happens to a transplant recipient who was frail at the time of transplantation? Is there a way that they can bounce back um, and regain some of this physiologic reserve? What we saw was actually very interesting. In the first month, so here we have the change in the frailty score on the y-axis by the month since transplantation. So in the first month, on average, kidney transplant recipients became a little bit more frail. By the second month, they were actually back down to where they were at the time of transplantation. But the crucial time came at three months, when in fact there was, on average, improvements in the frailty score. Patients gained uh, physiologic reserve. They were able to bounce back. And what we think is happening here is that in the first month, what you're seeing is the kind of consequences of a major invasive surgery. By the second month, they're kind of balancing out with the restoration in kidney function. But by the third month, you can see the clear benefits of kidney uh, function restoration. And that's now being outweighed over the, the challenges and traumas of having a major surgery. And I was very excited about this the first time I saw this and we looked at this data. I brought it up to some of my clinical colleagues and they said, well, but of course. We see this every day. We know that this is what happens. By three months, that's when we see that our patients on average look a little bit better. They're starting to really enjoy the benefits of the restored kidney function. And to us, this is um, nice to see that the work that we're doing is actually um, corresponding with what's seen in the clinical practice. This is still talking on averages, though. And what we'd like to do is to further understand which, for, uh, which kidney transplant recipients start off frail and have an improved tra trajectory. They get better. They have a restored um, kidney function, and they have a decrease in their uh, they have an increase in their physiologic reserve. But what about the other patients that start off frail, have a transplantation, but never really recover from that? They end up being stuck in that frail status. So we haven't really delved into this much further, but we'd like to better understand the long-term uh, trajectories of frailty and to understand what is it about this unique population that um, starts off frail and continues to be frail from um, after they go through this major invasive surgery. One of the other points that we made in this article was that 
frailty at the time of transplantation was actually, if you were frail at the time of transplantation, you were actually most likely to have a benefit from the transplantation in kind of the restoration of your kidney function. We found that overall the biggest changes were happening to those who were in that three or above um, component category. So does anybody have any questions about this? Is there anything that they'd like to discuss you know, further about the research? Yes. Yes. Interesting. You know, not always, yeah. not always physiological. It can be some other impact or exterior that come in and, and allow them to, to take on that frail. They've already kind of self defined as being frail, yeah. and, and are they able? And it's like being sick, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And now it's like everything. Yeah. And I mean, you're not sick. You know, your kidney's sick, but the rest of you are functioning. Not for everybody, but I think for mm -hmm. people. And notice the shift later on in the community that they were a little more conscious, a little more independent. Their kidney was sick. You know, they it redefined who they were by seeing themselves in a different context. Yeah. Yeah. And there hmm. are still a few people who want to get. Interesting. So the, my, uh, my question or comment, I guess, is that when you're defining frailty, mm -hmm. that is such a key thing that, and it's a fear factor. Like yeah. You have that first fall, and I know even myself, you have that first fall, and you're scared stupid for a long time. Yeah. You limit your activities, you redefine how, how what your, your, your living space is. Shifts. Yeah. So I think there's a, probably a few ways that we could get at that, and then I'll, I'll talk about one of the other papers that I don't have included in this talk. Um, we do measure the kidney disease quality of life, which really gets at this idea of how, what type of burden does your kidney disease have on you? How do you respond to the disease state that you have? And maybe when we, m we move forward in thinking about how we can um, redefine or maybe tweak this frailty definition to make ESRD specific, that's a kind of component that may be really important is this perception of um, frailty. And this links, I think, very nicely to some work that was done um, actually by one of our medical students who joined us for uh, about a year of research. Um, she looked at perceived frailty, both from the patient and the provider side, versus actual measured frailty. and what even by telling the patients and the providers, this is what we mean by frailty. It's about, it has a concordance of about 50%, which is, means that um, physicians and patients cannot define themselves as being frail any better than they can flip a coin to decide whether they're frail. So it's not something that's naturally captured. You need a measure to actually measure it on patients. It's not necessarily that, that patients can decide, oh, I'm frail or not frail. So this may be capturing a different domain of risk that's related but would add information to the measure that, uh, of this phenotype. I think that's very important and very interesting to think about. May I just interrupt that? You know, as you said, it's not mm -hmm. frail anymore, frail. Mm -hmm. To me, that makes it just so much sense. Yeah. Because in the matter, their, their comfort zone. Yep. Mm -hmm. Out of home, yeah. 
very powerful ties to the dialysis center, to their their colleagues at their, their family, yep, their yep. Yeah. Um, and let me go back to this slide because you guys actually didn't point this out, though I get this question um, almost universally when I present this. How can it be that you have dialysis patients that report very good or excellent health? Well, compared to everyone around them, they think, oh, look, I'm doing fine. This, you know, this friend of mine, he's been declining all these years on dialysis. I've watched him, but you know, I still feel pretty good. I still feel pretty robust. And so they report very good or excellent health. Um, and, and this is something that we find very interesting too, that there, there's a group that seems a little bit more resilient, that's able to say, yeah, I've got kidney disease. Yep, I'm undergoing dialysis, but you know what? I'm not doing so bad otherwise. Yeah. How do you perceive your illness? Yeah. You, and that could be, and that could be really where we differ from studying community dwelling older adults, where you can't necessarily ask them about a given specific disease. You can say, well, how do you handle your health? Mm, maybe that's not really getting at it. But here, if we actually get patients to give us some insight into what kidney disease means to them, that could be a really important component of resilience that we haven't captured here. This is, you know, I'm, I'm doing this. I was invited here to give you guys a talk. I'm going to walk away learning much more than, than maybe you guys even have. That's going to be the next, um, I, I won't say half because we're not really at half of my presentation, but the next piece of the, um, of the presentation. And if there's any other questions on this, there's one more and then I'll get to it. Yes. What are the kind of time trends associated with frailty is increasing over time? My gut reaction says, well, yes, it probably is increasing over time. Um, I'd have to see. There's one publication that came out recently um, from Dr. Bandine Roche at um, Hopkins, and I don't. It was using national data, and, and I'm not 100% certain whether she looked at time trends. The problem is we don't have many studies where you'd be able to go back and kind of fit this definition to it, um, but that would be very interesting. We definitely know, um, and we've done some work at least on older adults that are receiving transplants in the U.S., and we see that the elderly transplant recipient 10 years ago even is very different than the elderly transplant recipient today. They actually have a much higher burden of comorbidity. They're actually older elderly than the previous older old, um, and we see that we have more women, uh, more African Americans that are older that are getting transplants. So we know that there is definitely at least a changing landscape there. I, I would assume that, that the, there's a higher prevalence of frailty throughout time too as our population is changing, it's an aging population. Good, any other? Yes. So let me move on to that second part of oh, uh, the next part is, well, what can we do to improve the clinical care for the transplant recipients? Uh, and thank you, and I would love to talk to you more about that because that's actually something that we're struggling with right now is how do we do this? How do we intervene? And I'll talk about this in another few slides. So we've clearly shown that um, ESRD represents a high risk uh, subset of all uh, adults, regardless of their age, with ESRD. It's a measure that we think captures uh, physiologic reserve and a unique domain of risk that increases risk prediction in this population. But what can we do with it? If we know a patient is frail with one individual in front of us, well, what can we do? We kind of have thought about it from two sides. The first is that we could use frailty to enhance uh, the selection of patients for transplantation. And the second is interventions, which I'll get to uh, a little bit more. Uh, I'm hearing a little bit from you guys uh, where you see frailty fitting into the patient selection uh, into, with interventions, but does anybody have any thoughts on frailty in uh, recipient selection? Yes. 
this, can, this actually becomes a very uh, hot button issue when I present this in the, to the geriatrics and gerontology. So let me tell you what we're thinking about this. So we think of frailty as being kind of a very important way to counterbalance chronologic age. Can we get at a different measure that's a unique domain of risk that isn't just looking at recipient age? So we think that it'd be important to include frailty in the transplant evaluation to help improve recipient selection. We actually are starting to measure frailty on all of our patients coming in for evaluation and including that as part of the discussion at the listing meeting. Um, what we think frailty can do to help improve recipient selection is to help us identify potentially marginal candidates who are in fact uh, physiologically robust. They're not frail. We could also decide against transplanting uh, frail candidates, and especially those who are young. If we see a patient is quite young and frail, is that really the right candidate versus maybe an older non-frail candidate? Uh, and these are things that we have to think about in the setting of a uh, resource-limited uh, population. And I think very important for us, and this is the key point when I present this work to um, our other colleagues in geriatrics and gerontology, is that in fact we believe frailty is an important tool to help us identify which older adults will do well and which won't. Um, if we can identify the right older candidates for transplantation, we could actually improve and open up access to transplantation. Um, at least with, with the guidelines in the US, there's a very heavy weight put on recipient age in, in deciding whether or not a patient gets a transplantation. And we don't feel that that's actually appropriate because you're not capturing the true factor that's driving risk in this population. And so if we had this other piece of information that would help us understand what the singular number of a chronologic age is, that would actually help us better identify transplant recipients. And then, as we've already started the discussion, um, what can we do to improve patient outcomes? So prehabilitation um, is exactly one of the ways that we've been thinking about um, intervening on this population. And we've just received two kind of small grants to get this up and going um, at Hopkins. We have, um, a, we have a Department of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation, and we're just starting to talk to them about kind of the nitty gritty, what does a prehabilitation actually look like for an ESRD population? And prehabilitation is really a word that we uh, use to talk about um, strengthening someone and getting them up to their kind of optimum self before they go on to transplantation or other major surgery. Uh, we believe that transplantation is gonna be beneficial to many patients, but what can we do, especially with our frail potential recipients, to get them primed and ready for this major surgery? Uh, we, we've been starting to work on this. Uh, we think it's going to be a great way to move ahead to actually improve the outcomes for these patients. Um, but the challenge, though, is we always have to be able to disentangle the prehabilitation from the actual improvements in frailty, um, because you're always going to see an improvement in frailty if you're getting people to move more, given that one of the components is uh, the um, Minnesota leisure time activities. How much activity do you have? If you already get them past that threshold of physical inactivity through prehabilitation, are we actually going to see meaningful changes in outcomes? And that's going to be one of the biggest challenges that we struggle with now. Uh, can we do more than just improve their physical function and their physical activity and actually extend this to uh, reduce these poor outcomes that I showed you earlier on? So we are starting this now. We think that this is one way to move ahead. Um, but I'd love to open this up to the group and hear other possibilities or other um, options that, that you would consider or you think would be important to your population. Um, and while I do that, I would like to actually recognize all the people that put a lot of hard um, effort and time into doing this work. I did mention that we measure frailty on our transplant recipients throughout the day. Um, they staff all of our evaluation clinics, many of the dialysis sessions, um, and it really takes uh, quite a long list of research assistants over there, um, as well as faculty involvement, um, clinician, nurse involvement, we need people to be on board and understand the mission of trying to improve these patients' health through a better understanding of this high-risk population. So I'm greatly indebted to them, and of course to my mentor, Dr. Dori Segev, who really has helped lead the fight for uh, understanding frailty in an ESRD population. Thank you.
So we have a few minutes left for questions. Yes. Yeah, so the kind of three, um, the three broad categories of prehabilitation end up being nutritional, kind of a mental health, uh, and a physical rehabilitation. We are going to stick with the physical um, because there is some evidence that um, physical activity interventions do improve frailty status in community dwelling older adults. We think that there's the best, the nutritional things haven't played out so well. Um, it's it kind of falls more in line too with my expertise and what I understand the nutrition side. Um, we would really need to develop a whole new expertise and really kind of bring people in from outside of Hopkins. We don't really have a strong kind of background from there. I think it would be interesting and I'm not, but I don't necessarily feel as confident about that. I, I think we're gonna at least start with the physical side and then potentially expand from there, including mental health rehabilitation and potential having dietitians um, come to help um, with a diet uh, prehabilitation too. The thing uh, with this population, at least for us and for our group, is that they, um, they already have um, dietitians that are helping with their counseling at the dialysis center. There's already people that are supposed to be doing that, and we couldn't necessarily conceive of what more we would provide um, uh, unless it was something that was really intensive that goes above and beyond what they're already getting. But that's, yeah, that is a great point. Yes. Yeah, um, so these are things that we're still working out. We kind of have divided this work into two different pilots. One is to provide foot peddlers to patients undergoing dialysis. Um, and we're actually, there's a few components there. Um, one is to provide tablets to do cognitive training. And the other is to do kind of foot peddlers to do some physical training while on dialysis. So what interventions can we give to patients that can be administered at the, the dialysis center and be done while on dialysis? Um, that's a pilot study that we are um, we got IRB approval for this week. So we're just at the um, point of being able to work with the dialysis center to start recruiting patients to this. So you don't currently have people coming into the center? No, but we feel like for the right patient, and that's going to be part of what we have to identify and understand better, for the right patient, this is a golden opportunity um, when they're sitting, sedentary behavior, it's happening quite often you know, in their lives. Um, can we do something to, to reduce that sedentary time and to actually get some physical activity going? And the same thought is to, as opposed to just having a patient watch TV or sleep, can we give them something to kind of charge them cognitively to? Um, so that's one side of our kind of thoughts on prehabilitation. Um, and that's going to be underway quite soon. The other, which is probably another few months off, um, given that we just received funding to do this, is an intensive prehabilitation program that would occur outside of the dialysis center. It would occur at a rehabilitation clinic, an outpatient rehabilitation clinic within Hopkins, in which we would just go through a very, um, a very routine rehabilitation uh, routine. So it would include kind of stretching, some um, slow warm ups, it would include some cardiovascular and strength training, and then um, cool down, and then there would be exercises to continue throughout um, the week between the prehabilitation centers, uh, prehabilitation sessions, sorry. Yeah. We, there are very few um, interventions that we can talk about in public health that really have these pleiotropic effects like physical activity. So we know that physical activity increases uh, mental health, it improves um, depression, improves a lot of other mental health issues. We also know that it's the most important intervention you can do to improve cognitive function. Um, there's nothing else really that we do that's going to aid patients and help improve cognitive function nothing that comes to the same level as physical activity. And we also think it'll improve um, physical outcomes too, so strength and, and other factors like that. Exactly, so let me get this one, then I'll come back. Yes? I'm just looking at the oh. time between the program and the mm -hmm. 
Wow. The biggest failure is when the people who come to the gym are smaller than they are. Yep. So they, they are just driven to do this. And it's easier for all of you to go, but still only such a small percentage of our daughters are still coming. Yeah. <coughs> so the challenge is always to get more to come out. The way I get them to the gym, I can't lose weight if we don't. Really? So Oh, you've got to do this too. Yeah, but it's still, it's a hard sell when it's like limited energy, unlimited time and and lots of resources. And that's part of the reason that we're trying to deliver the intervention of physical activity while on dialysis. For the prehabilitation pilot, and I didn't mention this before, we're specifically targeting patients that are within three to six months of their transplantation. (coughs) And we're hoping that saying, to them, listen, you've got a major surgery coming up. Let's see what we can do to help you get primed and ready for this. We're hoping that's going to be the important sell. Um, It would come not only from us as researchers, but also from their clinical nephrologist and their transplant surgeons. Well, certainly I do get the transplant surgeons who do weight loss also before they're going to dialysis. Oh, yeah. So I I get both, and and it's great, but it's it's still there's an attitude when it's something again. Yeah. And once they start the program, they feel the benefits, they'll continue it, but it's a massive amount of time. That, that first burden of just being able to get them in there. Well, that's wonderful insight. Thank you. And if you have Yeah. Um, yeah, it, we, I had a, a, a master's student last year who was going to initiate a project on nutrition. She was a dietitian who was very interested in frailty and ESRD. And unfortunately, that didn't pan out because we, the nutritional data was never ready for us. Um, but it would be worthwhile to revisit that with her as, as our school year starting again. Um, but um, we don't have, I'm trying to even think if we have anything from the geriatrics literature. There, there must be something that I, I don't, no, necessarily off the top of my head, um, but that's you know that's another avenue that may be very important and very rich to kind of understand better. Um, similar to that, um, I do have a student that's working on a project now looking at medication use and frailty. You know, is it that frail patients also have a much higher burden of, of medication use, and is that somehow impacting? Um, their frailty status. So again, I think these are kind of other novel areas that we need to be able to better understand. Um, and part of it has just been being able to get together these cohorts. We ha- it requires a direct measurement. It requires primary data collection. Um, we can't necessarily use the, our national databases to do this work. So it does take more time and effort. But the beauty is that we can delve into these kind of other areas that aren't going to be captured in, at all in, in registry data a little bit further. But Yeah. Yeah. Um, because they think this is a difficult road ahead. They're going to be dumped into another difficult role in the game. And I know just from some of our um, patients, they're, um, they're, they've still got the rose-colored glasses on, so they're kind of thinking, yeah. oh, this is a safe territory, but it's, it's, it's getting more involved than we think. They don't care, and maybe they do when they classify, like they they know what they have to do uh, with too much information. But they pick what they want to hear, and yeah. the good story is that till later when they oh I didn't know it was that, that bad. Well yeah, so mm-hmm. how do you how do kids cope when they're not yeah. Kids? You know even from habitual how how do you how do you cope to feel safe with them? Yeah. Yeah, and this would be an interesting population to be able to look at that in, um, given that it's a primarily urban um, medical uh, university setting. Um, so we do draw a lot of our patient population from the Baltimore and surrounding areas, as well as patients coming in, kind of more complicated cases too. Yeah. 
that's yeah, that's another thing. Great insight. Any other last thoughts? No. Thank you. I, I really appreciate all the the discussion that we've had and feedback. I know this is going to go uh, back with me to Baltimore and will help strengthen a lot of the work we do. And I hope that you were able to get a little bit of a insight into some of this work on frailty and maybe take some back to the work that you do too. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.